I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's February 28th, and we have a lot to talk about. Two years ago, the National MS Society made a public commitment to do more to ensure that the MS movement was open to and reflective of everyone affected by MS. And when you stop to consider issues like access to health care or MS clinical research, I think you quickly come to realize that diversity, equity, and inclusion aren't only organizational goals for the MS Society. They also address some of the systemic barriers that impact the quality of care for members of historically marginalized communities who are living with MS. Joining me in exploring how the MS Society is embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of the MS movement is the National MS Society's Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Nisha Fredericks. But before we get to my conversation with Nisha, there are a few other things that you should know about. Researchers continue to find evidence that the road to managing our immune system goes through the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome contains the bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses that make up the trillions of microorganisms that live in our gastrointestinal tract. These gut microbiota play an important role in the development of our immune system and in our body's immune response. And since MS is itself a misdirected immune response, researchers have focused their efforts to better understand the relationship between the gut microbiome and multiple sclerosis. Research has already shown us that the gut microbiome is different among people living with MS, with some of these differences already observable in young people living with pediatric-onset MS. Now, research findings from a team at the University of Virginia point to a specific contributor to the autoimmune response and subsequent neuroinflammation that characterize multiple sclerosis. Just as a quick refresher, in an autoimmune disease like MS, the body's immune system mistakes its own tissues as foreign invaders, and so it attacks them. This attack causes inflammation. In multiple sclerosis, this inflammation is directed at the myelin sheath that protects the nerve fibers in our central nervous system. This demyelination disrupts the normal communication between these nerves, and that disrupted communication in the central nervous system produces the symptoms and disability that accompany MS. The University of Virginia research team identified an immune system controller or regulator found in the intestine that can reprogram the gut microbiome to promote chronic inflammation. This controller is a protein called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And when the researchers block the activity of this protein in T cells, which are part of our immune system, it changed the microbiome of lab mice, reducing inflammation and enabling the mice to recover from the mouse version of MS. Now, there's quite literally a big difference between how the immune system in a mouse reacts and responds and how the immune system in a human might react and respond. But because this immune system regulator can easily be targeted by medication, the research team is hopeful that one day, using this same approach, doctors will easily be able to resolve the inflammation that drives MS. There's a lot more work to be done exploring this potential pathway to resolving inflammation in the central nervous system by fine-tuning the gut microbiome, but the University of Virginia researchers have certainly opened the door to that future research. Now, if you'd like to review the details of this research, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Artificial intelligence, or AI, involves training computer systems to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence, such as recognizing patterns, making predictions, and making decisions. 
and scientists are continuing to discover ways that AI can be incredibly useful in the field of multiple sclerosis research and treatment. With the huge amounts of data generated by MS patients and research studies, AI can help to analyze this data, identify patterns, and generate insights that could lead to new treatments, diagnostic tools, and improved patient outcomes. For example, researchers are already using AI to analyze MRI scans and identify patterns that could help to diagnose MS earlier and more accurately. AI is also being used to develop new drugs and treatment options. By analyzing the molecular and genetic data of MS patients, AI can help to identify specific targets for new drugs and predict which treatments are most likely to be effective for individual patients. Another area where AI is making an impact in MS research is in predicting disease progression. By analyzing large amounts of patient data, including demographic, clinical, and genetic factors, AI can help to identify which patients are most likely to experience disease progression and when. And AI is also being used to develop personalized treatment plans for MS patients. By analyzing patient data, including genetic and environmental factors, AI can help to identify the treatments that are most likely going to be effective for individual patients and adjust these treatments as needed based on ongoing data analysis. Now, of course, there are also challenges and ethical considerations to keep in mind when it comes to the use of AI in MS research and treatment. It's important to ensure that AI is being used in a responsible and transparent way. This includes being clear about the data being used to train AI systems, ensuring that data is being used in an ethical and secure manner, and being transparent about the limitations of AI systems. And it's also important to ensure that AI is being used in a way that is inclusive and accessible to all MS patients, regardless of socioeconomic status or other factors. So while there are certainly challenges to be addressed, the use of AI in MS research and treatment holds tremendous promise for the future of MS care. So, why did I decide to include this short summary recapping the impact of artificial intelligence in MS research and treatment? Well, I wanted to demonstrate how far AI has already come. You see, everything you've just heard was actually written by an AI robot. By now, many of you have probably heard about ChatGPT, the AI robot that doesn't communicate in arcane programming language or geek speak. Instead, ChatGPT interacts in a normal, conversational way. I asked ChatGPT to write a podcast script about artificial intelligence and MS, and in less than a minute, it wrote every word you just heard. ChatGPT is already being used for all kinds of things. In fact, a week ago, just for fun, perhaps just showing off, ChatGPT passed the U.S. medical licensing exam. There's not much doubt that artificial intelligence will have an impact on clinical research, and it's pretty safe to say that to varying degrees, it's going to impact every area of healthcare as we know it today. This is certainly a subject we'll keep you updated on. Using ChatGPT is free, and if you'd like to try your hand at interacting with ChatGPT, you'll find the link in today's show notes. Using actual human intelligence, the National MS Society has spent the past couple of years ensuring that the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion are embedded in everything the society does and in everything that touches the MS movement, from research to treatment. In a moment, we'll meet my guest, the National MS Society's Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Nisha Fredericks. In June 2021, the National MS Society made a commitment, a very public commitment, to do more to ensure that the MS movement is a place for everyone affected by MS. Nisha Fredericks is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the National MS Society. Welcome to the podcast, Nisha. 
Thank you, John. I'm very happy to be here. I want to start with a question I hope everyone already knows the answer to, but I always like to get our definitions out right up front. So tell me how you define diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is an excellent question. I'm really glad you asked because a lot of times people do have some preconceived notions when they hear the word diversity um, that we're only talking about race and ethnicity. Um, And we are talking about race and ethnicity, but we are also um, in this work, we focus on gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, military status, disability status, familial status, geography, economics, education. There is so much that is woven into who we are that makes us unique. And that's where our diversity lives. So diversity is who we are. Equity is um, that the thought process and really practice around ensuring that um, we are thinking about what potentially may have been challenges and barriers in people's lives because of their diversity and their lived experience that has prevented them from having access and doing the work to mitigate the harm or to give, um, to provide concessions and opportunities where there hasn't been that opportunity. And one example might be, um, and, you know, the case of, um, of someone who doesn't have access to education, how might that impact their ability to grow wealth throughout their lifetime and thus also be able to have um, access, you know, things that go along with wealth, access to um, safe, safe place to live, um, quality food, continued education, and that just kind of continues on, right? So it's, if it starts with one person, that's typically a cycle that people have a hard time breaking through. So the work of equity looks to minimize those harms to ensure that truly everybody has, um, is, is positioned to be able to get what they need, even if they didn't start from the same place due to systemic barriers. And then inclusion is really about the intentional work that we do to um, lift voices and call in voices where they are absent. Um, And it really is intentional work. It requires us to be thoughtful, to slow down um, when we're making decisions. And, you know, something as simple as it being in a meeting when we're asking people for their opinion, are we slowing down enough and are we creating room for people who who perhaps are not speaking up regardless of what the reasons might be? Maybe there's someone who always has a brilliant idea and they're thinking, well, they always listen to Charlie, so I might as well just sit back and wait for Charlie to come up with what I'm thinking. We don't know, right? But if we stop, we pause and give people an, an opportunity to to be included, you know, that's, they, they will be. And we, at the end of the day, if we are um, intentional in that, then we'll create a sense of belonging and really create an environment where everyone can thrive. Everything you just said sounds like something so basic, something so foundational. You rattled off some really important values, mm-hmm. not a job, but DEI is something we see in companies and organizations everywhere today. Mm -hmm. Why? What is it that necessitates that this position be codified into an organizational chart instead of just so much common sense for all of us? The reason why it is for many organizations a priority, and I will say a strategic priority, is because what can feel like common sense is typically those things that we do sort of just without thinking. And it is with that out thinking, decision making, and action uh, that puts people in a position where they may not have the opportunities, right? And so we really want to be thinking strategically about where are the where are our opportunities as an organization to ensure that um, for example if we're looking for talent 
Um, are we thinking about emerging talent and and all of the places where we could be recruiting? You know, typically a lot of organizations, and especially you know, I, I don't know why a big bank came to he- to my mind, but um, I used to work for an accounting organization and. Um, we saw a lot of students coming into the profession from, you know, the Ivy League schools, right? Because that's where folks that were in the profession went to school. So for them, their thinking was, this is where we find talent. But there's a, a whole host of, um, of universities that actually could be a resource, like our our, our minority serving institutions, um, our historically black, black colleges and universities, our Native American serving institutions, our Hispanic serving institutions that are a great place for us to source talent. And But if we're not thinking about what we're just systematically doing, because it's common sense for me to do what I've always done, we've missed a tremendous amount of opportunity. And then, you know, what's critical for us um, um, here at the society is that when we're doing that, right, and it doesn't, it's not, you know, we're certainly going to get the job done because we needed a resource, we got a resource, we're getting a job done. But if our job to be done is to be more inclusive and to be more and more welcoming of all people that live with MS, then we, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to really think about who do we have on staff, that can help us in that engagement and in that outreach that has a similar lived experience that can speak authentically with people to really bring them in and help them feel safe and know that this is their MS society too. So it's, you know, I'm giving you an example of why, you know, a few examples of why we think about it here at the society, but organizationally, it's why a lot of organizations are thinking about it. You know, it's, it's, you are looking at the water that we've been swimming in and recognizing that we're pretty wet with um, with how we've always done things and we need to shake it off and start to think anew. And this gives us an opportunity with a different set of eyes and um, calling in different perspective to, perspectives to challenge the way we've always done things. And that's what the work of DEI does. It really is a strategic imperative as much as people like to think of it as only a one and done learning opportunity. Um, it's really, it's how we look at the whole of our work and holistically find opportunities to be more thoughtful about how we are um, driving towards our organizational goals. So tell me about your role at the society. Well, um, so when I was hired some 16 months ago, um, I can't believe it's been that that long. Um, some days it feels like a long time. Other days it feels like just yesterday. Because <laughs> as you can imagine, any organization, there's a lot to learn. Um, but one of the things that I focused on, what I was hired to do, um, was, you know, overarching goal, embed DEI in everything we do, right? That was the hope and dream of, um, of our leaders when they um, were kind enough to bring me into this role and give me this opportunity. And so a lot of my work has really been spending time to understand who we are as an organization. Um, what are our current capabilities and capacities? And really, you know, looking at, um, you know, where are our strategic opportunities? I spent a, a some a number of months um, when I first arrived, interviewing our staff, interviewing our volunteers um, to understand not just their experience from a workplace perspective, but where are they finding challenges and being able to deliver upon their um, professional goals and our organizational goals. And thinking about how we want, you know, we we want to be more responsive, how, you know, looking at where are opportunities to be proactive. So in a lot of ways, um, I am a thought partner in that process, right? And it's, you know, kind of looking at, like, this is our opportunity and identifying and looking at um, where where have we, what do, how do we go about approaching um, a problem um, and identif- helping people think through you know, what are the different ways that we can approach this problem and who are the resources that we have um, aligned to help solve that problem and where are the voices coming from? So a lot of the work that I do is, again, really around helping us just look at, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, 
who we are as an organization today, looking at the gaps that we have from a um, capacity, and that could be education, it could be resources, and really helping um, people to be able to look at their work differently to solve real life problems that that we have that and that the people that 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 we're um looking to to serve people living with ms to help them solve the challenges and help them truly live their best lives let's talk about a couple of those real life challenges when you think about having access to health care it's not mm-hmm. hard to call out the systemic inequities that exist that serve as very real obstacles to getting care in many minority communities the yeah. MS Society is committed to seeing that everyone has access to quality health care. So how do we go about eliminating some of these systemic obstacles to care? Mm. Education, right? So education is always the key. Um, but having the information is no good if you don't have the relationships. So we do have a, a large or a large part of our um, health equity plan is focused on, yes, empowering people. But part of how you do that is engaging with healthcare providers and letting them know, A, we're here as a resource and we have um, the information that you need to be able to get to a diagnosis faster um, and to also help um folks understand their own bias um, and how that plays into providing care. And that providing care can even start with even just getting a diagnosis to begin with, right? Believing people um, when they present to you with symptoms and not and understanding where your bias might live and what assumptions you are making as a healthcare provider around why someone is in pain. Whatever the challenge may be, just really being thoughtful and intentional around that. But a lot of times, again, if we don't, if we're not aware of our own bias, we can't do anything about it. And all of us um, have bias. So it's not like we're going around looking to wag a finger in anybody's face because it is, is something we all live with. And, you know, bias saves us every day. You know, we don't go walking in the middle of a street. If, you know, we're in New York City, we recognize that traffic may not stop. And so we use our bias to make a quick decision um, to, for, to ensure our safety. But safety is not always, you know, something that we're walking around with as our reality and something we need to protect ourselves from. But we do make a lot of decisions that have um, profound impacts on people's lives. And so we want to do as much as we can to make sure that we are engaging with as many providers as we can, and especially in those underrepresented and underserved communities, to just be that thought partner with them and be their, you know, be their co-collaborator in ensuring that we have, um, that we're breaking through that barrier that is preventing people from the access to the care that they need. But it really is, again, it's about education. It's about relationship building and engagement. When you were talking about bias a moment ago, I was thinking how over time, bias becomes culturally embedded. And I I wonder about the cultural obstacles. For for instance, how do we change long-held beliefs and behaviors that have developed within historically marginalized and overlooked communities. For, for instance, it's not uncommon for a member of the Latinx community to consult a priest when they're facing a chronic illness like MS. How do we get them to consult a neurologist? Uh, how do we make sure members of the Black community know that clinical trials have changed and there are safeguards or even federal laws to make sure Mm -hmm. that a brutal tragedy like the Tuskegee study never happens again. How do we change some of those biases that have become strong beliefs because they have been so deeply embedded within the culture? Yeah, you're you're right. And that's really hard, right? Because when we look, um, the thing about bias is that we always look for evidence to support what we believe. And so what we what what's important for us to do and is is core to how we're thinking and looking at the pro, the our activities around engaging is meeting people where they are. 
we're not going to um, be able to flip a light switch and and nor do we want to tell people to stop, you know, leveraging the resources that have been fundamental to them, that are part of their culture, that give them strength. All of that is important. It is important for someone to consult with their priest if that's where they find peace, because we know that um, spiritual, mental, you know, it's all connected, right? So we're not, we don't want to move people away from that, but being where they are and um, letting them know that we're there for them where they are is the, is the critical piece, right? And just to, to show, to show up, to show up. Historically, clinical trials have been overwhelmingly white, but we've learned that MS impacts members of the black community differently. It impacts members of the Latinx community differently than it does white people. So, so it's especially important that these populations are represented in MS clinical research. Is the society involved in work to make clinical trials more diverse? Yes, we absolutely are. Um, And one of the ways that we do that is in collaboration with other um, organizations is in our corporate healthcare partner roundtable, um, where we do focus the conversation on the gap, um, acknowledge the gap in clinical trials and um, co-create um, opportunities for us uh, for to to ensure that we do have representation in clinical clinical trials, but we also have taken that a step further by requiring that all society supported clinical trials have a plan to recruit um, diverse participants because it is critical that we understand. Um, how MS shows up differently in people um, of different races and ethnicities so that we can, you know, make sure that we're providing the, 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 the education and the resources to ensure that everyone gets the care that they need. So those are a few of the ways that we are focused in that area. To add a little bit of scale to what you just said for the benefit of my listeners, when we talk about sure. society funded research, Just a reminder, the National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS research in the world. So this is more than a couple of studies. When I introduced you, I mentioned that in June 2021, the MS Society publicly committed to be doing more to ensure that the MS movement is a place for everyone affected by MS. Can you talk about the progress that's being made in fulfilling that commitment? Absolutely. And that's a great question. I appreciate you asking, John. Um, So as you can imagine, a lot of organizations um, really jumped into action after the murder of George Floyd. That was a turning point for a lot of people in America. And I'd say even around the world, um, there is recognition that we have some true systemic issues, right? And um, in terms of progress, I will say, you know, we like, you know, I think we acknowledge, like a lot of organizations, that DEI is a journey. And each step we take on that journey, it is progress towards um, a new future and um, a world where people, all people living with MS, um, can truly live their best lives. So what we are focused on, um, I'll say, is really long-term systemic change um, that is foundational and really helps us support the long-term impact we'd like to see. Now, in terms of progress, um, and I would say we've actually even made progress even before that point, right? So that was a public statement we made, but that wasn't our first um, time as an organization seeking to um, increase diversity and representation. So I do want to share a little bit about that um, first as I talk about that progress from 2021 on. Um, So prior to um, 2021, Cindy, our CEO, had the foresight to to launch a CEO DEI advisory committee. Um, so there are several CEO advisory committees, but there um, we are in our fifth year now of one focused on DEI. And so I would say that that and that was pre twenty twenty one, right? And that um, group was very much focused on the work that we can do in this space. Um, so you know, and then additional progress as an organization. Um, we've launched four employee resource groups. Our employees re- employee resource groups are 
an amazing way um, for us to bring people with very um, specific lived experiences into um, the work of the mission. Um, and we have, as I said, we have four. One is for our military community network. Another is called Workability, and that's for people that are living with various disabilities, including MS, and these are all staff. Um, and then we have one for our racially and ethnically diverse staff, as well as our society pride um, for folks that are in the LGBTQ plus community. And then we've also um, launched and have held two MS experience summits, one for Black people living with MS, and the other the one um, that we launched this past year for Hispanic and Latinx folks living with MS. And this has been a tremendous resource for people as they've been able to connect with others that, that they feel have a very similar lived experience as them, and they feel less alone. And so that is um, a body of work that we've made a, a, a huge investment in. Um, and it's not just a point in time experience. We've really been focused on expanding that engagement to make sure that um, there's always a connection for um, for the, for those folks here at the society. So that is work that we're quite proud of. And as I said, there's a lot of various things that we can point to that we've done as an organization. Really, you know, at the end of the day, we are really focused on what can we do systemically to ensure that from a long-term perspective, we are the MS Society for everyone that needs us. Like many parts of our society, when it comes to health care, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are ongoing efforts, uh, more, yes, of a, they are. more of a journey as opposed to a destination. You are absolutely correct. And, and it's, the work will always evolve, right? Um, it's, there, it's, there's definitely a nuance in how we approach this work, and it is absolutely a journey. Well, while there's more to do, it's gratifying to see that we're at least moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Nisha Fredericks, thank you for all you do to ensure that in the MS movement, every voice is heard, every person is seen, and no one feels left behind. And thanks for talking with me today. Thank you again for having me, John. It has been my pleasure and privilege. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 286. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.